Welcome to, to a new uh, Wasabi Research Experience meeting. Uh, this time um, we have a special guest. His name is Caleb. He's the creator of CJDNS project. Basically, it's a network that can replace the internet. Basically, of course, is that that is very ambitious. Other Okay, he will tell us uh, better. Um, and part of this project is now already supported by the VIP 155 in, in, in Bitcoin uh, and Bitcoin and other libraries too. So uh, this is an effort that part of the Bitcoin community is doing in order to have a more uh, diverse and robust um, network um, uh, connectivity, let's say, or more resilient peer-to-peer -peer network. And well, uh, CJDNS is part of that too. Um, so, Caleb, welcome, and we are happy to, to have you here. Thank you very much, happy to be here. Um, yeah, so CJDNS, what is what is CJDNS? Really, it is a decentralized mesh networking protocol, which is designed to function under in the context of some of the nodes uh, misbehaving. That is, some of the nodes being adversarial. And that's actually very rare in, in routing protocols, networking protocols, because typically, um, if one of the nodes just starts announcing garbage to the other nodes, then they will just routing, turn the whole network into a big routing black hole. Um, notable exceptions are BGP, um, and that's obviously how the internet is routed, but uh, BGP is very hard to set up. And so one of the other aspects of CJDNS is it's source routed, and that means that when you send a packet uh, into the Can network, I yeah? Sorry for interrupting you. I, I would like to, to, to go back and, 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 and ask this question for you. What, what is wrong with the, what we have now? What do we okay. need? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, all, it's all centralized. And it's centralized in the hands of companies that don't necessarily like us. I mean, all you need to do is go read the newspaper, read uh, the, the New York Times, or read the... Um, any one of these newspapers or TV stations, and frankly, these are TV stations that haven't turned an honest profit in 20 years, and they are being controlled by the centralized centralized power structures, and these they, they are, t are telling the story now that we are the enemy. We are the enemy of the people. We are, because we're doing Bitcoin mining or any kind of... Um, uh, in crypto, crypto mining, that we are, we need to be shut down. We need to be stopped. And the, this, the, this saber rattling that we're seeing about how uh, it's the biggest uh, environmental disaster in history. And uh, to be clear here, this is not the biggest environmental disaster in history for a couple reasons. One is because it's actually not that big. Uh, to give you a reference, Russia flares off three times as many as much energy in gas it just from oil wells that have gas coming out and they just flare it off into this into the air as the amount of energy being used by bitcoin so it's actually not that big it's much smaller than other things that have much better lobbies but the other thing about crypto mining is that while it does use a lot of energy, it's also very effective at facilitating the transition to renewables because it uses the cheapest energy available. And actually the cheapest available energy is what comes from renewables because there's nothing cheaper than a solar panel. Once you put it up, it doesn't cost you anything to just let that solar panel sit there and run. So I'm very strongly of the belief that the, 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 the decentralized uh, finance and the crypto and the mining is actually not a uh, cause of uh, this massive environmental degradation. The reason why we're seeing this coming up in the media is because these companies, these people are lodging an attack against the decentralization community. And this is nothing new. We go back to the 90s. You have the same people, you know, you have Bill Gates saying that Linux is cancer. And now, you know, Bill Gates is buying up GitHub. And there's all of these people 
who are moving, uh, they're, they're making moves, and there, there is really a war on crypto going on. So it's very important right now that we're able to get our, our decentralized systems onto their own network, because if we're going to rely on a network that's run by the people who are attacking us, eventually they're going to shut us down. So that's that's really why CJDNS and the PKT project is so important for me, because the point here is that we're going to be building a, a mesh based network infrastructure where everybody can own a piece of the Internet. I don't, I don't want to just monologue okay. here. I mean, you, you have a question? No, 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 no. Um, yes. Now, if you can, if you can tell us what's the, 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 the vision, yeah. right? And how the, 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 the technology is built in order to bypass all these restrictions. Mm -hmm. And I would like personally know more about the, well, I understand the technology, but probably not everybody understands right. how it works. But about the um, how you work with the, your IPs as public keys and all the routings instead of right. What's the address? How to route to that address and how 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 everything plays together? Absolutely. So um, CJDNS is, as I said, it is. Um, uh, adversary tolerant. So, you know, you can have a bad router in that network and the network's not going to explode. And there's a couple ways that we do that. One of them is we have, um, we, we derive the IP address from the public key. And so we're using IP6 addresses and the address is basically the fingerprint of the public key. So when we do that, we get the, um, the ability of, you know, if so, if somebody says this is my IP address, you know that it's their IP address because you can just communicate with them and you you are able to compare it to their public encryption key. But that also poses another challenge, which is that it it um, it prevents hierarchical routing, which is typical of systems uh, routing uh, systems. So in in place of hierarchical routing, we use a system of source routing, and source routing means that. When you send the packet into the network, it already has the entire path that needs to take all the way source to destination. And the way that you get that route is going to be similar to the way that you do, well, is similar to the way you do a DNS lookup. You're sending a request to a route server, and that route server is giving you the path that you should use to get from point A to point B. And where we're going with this is that there's going to be multiple cloud ISPs is what we're calling them. And these cloud ISPs operate route servers and you just choose which one you want to do business with. And that one will handle the business of getting your traffic onto the network and then to where you want it to be. Um, why are we doing, uh, why do we have this semi-centralized model of uh, cloud ISPs as opposed to just doing a fully decentralized, let's route on a DHT, let's do everything like that. The reason why we're doing it the way we do it is because when you have, when, when your primary access to the internet is based on a network, you need to be able to call somebody when something doesn't work. If you're paying real money to be able to get on the, the network, then you need to be able to make a phone call or whatever and you need somebody to be able to handle that situation. And we need that, that entity to be there, to be the, that network operator to be able to fix that. But we need that not to be a monopoly that controls everybody's access to everything. So we have these cloud ISPs, which are a little bit like just a, a VPN company. And what they do is they manage all of the buying and selling of bandwidth leases from the people who are operating the actual infrastructure, and then they find routes through the the mesh in order to get you access to what you need. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, but I think that is something new, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it was not okay. And how yeah. how was that handled before, and how is that handled now? Yes, yeah, and, so and, and an additional. Yeah, so original CJDNS did use a DHT, and um, 
basically we we beat the we beat the software up as much as we could and we realized that there are fundamental limitations to a DHT based routing model that are unsolvable without switching to something that is different. So basically we can solve a lot of problems, but the problem we can't solve is my internet doesn't work. Who do I call? How do I fix this? And because we can't really solve that who do you call problem, that's why a fully decentralized routing infrastructure just doesn't isn't going to work in the long term. So in place of that, we create an ecosystem of different entities who can do routing for you, and then you just get to choose which one you want to work with. Okay, I see. Um, so going going down a level in, in, in complexity. I mean, from a normal user, right? Because now we are thinking all the time in normal users and translate this concept to. You know, to, to my mom. Um, what does it mean for my mom? What what problem does this technology solve? Right, right. So for an ordinary person, that's going to be, you're going to install the app onto your phone, on your computer, whatever, and then you're just going to be able to access the internet via your neighbor's Wi-Fi. That's what we're talking about here. You're just getting on onto your regular internet via your neighbor's Wi-Fi and you buy a VPN and the VPN company is paying your neighbor to provide you with that access to the internet. That's what a cloud ISP is. It's a VPN which goes and pays the person who's providing you with the access to get to that VPN. Does that make sense? It makes sense. And how successful is, is this right now? I mean, is it happening? So we're, we're in really um, early stages at this moment. We have the, the packet coin, which we're working on building all of this infrastructure on top of. What we need is we need a very, very low cost way to transact in tokens. Because when we're doing, when um, we're issuing bandwidth, the bandwidth is going to need to be tokenized so that people can buy and sell and trade the right to use bandwidth on a particular link. And so we need to make a token and it's not going to work to just use Ethereum because the gas fees are just uh, unacceptable. So we're working on a project which we call Token Strike and Token Strike is basically you just make your own little blockchain and you sign all the blocks, you're the issuer of the token, you sign all the blocks, and all that we need to do is have a means by which if the issuer does something nefarious, for example, claw back a token after they sold it to somebody, then we need to be able to um, I identify that nefarious activity and have nodes in the network which can, um, which can report to everybody that that issuer did something bad and then all of the software will be configured to not deal with that issuer until they fix their stuff. So that's what we're working on in order to be able to tokenize and issue bandwidth. So it basically we're talking about free tokens. You can just issue, you can make a token, you just download the Git repository and you compile it and you have a token. Um, and we're gonna need that in order for these devices to sell uh, their bandwidth as a token. And then we're gonna need uh, to use Lightning Network, which we're working on now, um, in order to transact those tokens using HTLC contracts. Now, um, CJDNS and VPN and uh, VPN app are um, all in alpha testing or beta testing. You can, you can try out the app on Android now. Um, and the and what we're what we're using now is we have uh, um, the PKT project is based on uh, a proof of work algorithm which is bandwidth hard and the bandwidth hardness is creating an artificial demand for bandwidth um, and so unlike a lot of these tokens I mean I don't need to explain to you guys necessarily what uh, is the difference between a token faucet and a proof of work. But I'm finding a lot of people that don't understand that a proof of work is proof of fair issuance, whereas 
uh, all of these other kind of tokens, uh, these different issuance processes, you can't prove that it was done fairly. So, um, yeah, we, we have the only, uh, and this is something else that I created, it's called Packet Crypt, and it is the only bandwidth hard proof of work. So it's really just a problem that is easier to solve if you solve it together with other miners. And um, the the Packet um, blockchain is based on the Packet Crypt uh, bandwidth hard proof of work. So this is going to incentivize people to build out large amounts of bandwidth, which we foresee helping uh, kickstart the the decentralized bandwidth marketplace, which will finally be used for getting people off of the legacy and centralized internet. Okay, and I don't know if I am the only one who who, need, who has to make questions, but anyway, <laughs> let me go with that. Uh, so what you're saying is that basically my neighbor or I can become uh, an internet service provider. Exactly, right? exactly. But you're not uh, going to need to do billing. You're not going to need to do uh, customer service. You're not even going to need to do routing. You're just going to set up that device and it's going to start earning you packet, which, I mean, you can convert that to whatever currency you would prefer to have. Okay, so I am now an internet service provider that provides the, 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 the connection to all my neighbors and they pay um, for bandwidth. They buy bandwidth to a, to a company. They that will company pay, exactly. They're going to pay a company in a simple, obvious way, you know, regular old, uh, maybe it's $29 a month, whatever, whatever that deal is. They're going to pay that to that company in, a, in that normal, obvious way. And then that company is going to have bandwidth traders who are going to buy those leases of bandwidth from you so that an individual, you, you know, grandma doesn't need to understand about trading bandwidth and buying the dip and these kinds of really complex things. That's the job of financial traders. Okay. And what is the... What is the um, proof of work that is hard in bandwidth? Why do we need that? Or, or who needs that? Um, the point of, of Packet Crypt is to create an artificial demand for bandwidth because demand drives supply. So when we create a demand for bandwidth, that's going to cause people to do to roll out more fiber. So think about all of the Bitcoin mining equipment that's just sitting there collecting dust because it's no longer profitable, right? You've got all this stuff from five years ago, 10 years ago, and it just doesn't make any money anymore. With PacketCrypt, if you install a fiber optic cable into your area in order to mine PacketCrypt, that fiber brings value forever, basically. So the we're, we're leveraging the externality of PacketCrypt mining in order to get more internet to more people. Okay, perfect. So basically, you know, we are Bitcoiners, right? And we are the, those Bitcoiners that many of us probably don't don't like other cryptocurrencies. So that's why I'm asking this, this thing. So do you are saying basically that, well, uh, the, the first design was not... Mm, it has some problems, and now with this new um, uh, cloud, um, I don't sorry, I don't remember the, the name, but yes, this this new um, cloud ISP. Yeah, now uh, of course you need a new token. I mean, you need a, a way to tokenize the bandwidth in order to to create a market of bandwidth. Uh, why is that not possible with, I mean, you need a, a market, right? Right. Is that market, before 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 making my question, is that market already um, running? Is, 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 is it working? Um, it's not really off the ground right yet, but uh, that's because we need the token strike project in order to be able to tokenize the bandwidth. But, um, okay, and 
let me let me address because you asked another you you said another thing about you know bitcoin maximalism and i get it like i i've been there i mean i've, I've been in the bitcoin community since 2011 um i know there's a lot of projects that are pretty shady and that's that's a reality here so why should we what why should we accept another coin as being legitimate so i'm going to give you a general answer which is that we there is a war on crypto right now and they are coming after the uh the work coins first and then that once they knock down once they're able to get control and stop they're going to come after the privacy coins so they're going to they're going to be hitting monero they're going to be coming after the work coins you know they're going to be coming after the, the wasabi wallet the all of the ways that people can uh achieve um uh, liberation from these centralized powers that they're going to be coming after us and if we don't work together then they are going to pick us off one at a time and you can see in their newspapers they're already uh they're already rattling the sword so we need to stick together here because there is a war against us and it's a war against decentralization and a war against open source and a war against individual liberty so that's the general answer of why we can't just bury our head in the sand and say my coin is the best everything else is a scam and um that uh th that's just not going to work because we will be pried apart and we will be killed one at a time and my, the the specific answer why is the packet a thing why don't we just use bitcoin etc well packet is a thing for two reasons and the two reasons are related to the two differences that it has from bitcoin the two fundamental changes that were made one of them is that we have uh, the bandwidth hard proof of work, which makes it so that it, the, the mining of packet incentivizes the rollout of network infrastructure. The second one is that packet has a network steward, which is a basically a founder's fee, but the founder, the so-called founder, can be changed via a proof of stake based vote. And that founder's fee is used in order to fund all these projects in the ecosystem to develop all the technology. You know, Bitcoin is, it's a great project, but it does not fa fund the wallets. I mean, I'm sure you guys understand developing Wasabi is not easy because there is no funding for that. The funding is for people who can build better SHA-256 chips. Yeah. Okay. Rafa? Yeah, I was just wondering, like, uh, did I understood correctly that you are using the, like, the same algorithm that Bitcoin uses? So you can uh, make use of these old, like, ASIC devices? No, uh, the algorithm is very different. But the point is that when you build out infrastructure to mine packet crypt, that infrastructure includes fiber optic because you need that bandwidth in order to mine. So that fiber optic that you've just run in order to mine packet crypt, when that mining installation becomes no longer um, profitable, that fiber is still there and that's still bandwidth that can reach out to people and get them on the internet. Okay, got it. And you mentioned that you're using the Lightning Network. Can you elaborate a little bit more like what part are you doing with that? We're just going to do our own Lightning Network. You know, I mean, it's uh, it's a, a Bitcoin fork with very few actual changes. So we're the, the point of this. And the fact is, I did not start this project in 2014, 15, 16, uh, because I was waiting for the transaction scalability that the Lightning Network would have, would afford. And so then in 2019, 2018, 19, the Lightning Network started to reach maturity. And so that was why I woke up the CJDNS project. CJDNS was asleep for uh, a good four or five years just because the other half of the ne the necessary technology just wasn't there yet. Okay. Well, well, something that I have never, never shared before with anyone is that I am 100% sure that they are going to come uh, for Wasabi Wallet at least. I'm I'm very sure. So <laughs> yes, I, I agree with, with you. Uh, and I think if if your project finally uh, is 
as useful as I think it is. Uh, of course, I will need to buy those tokens with Bitcoins <laughs> because it's, it's basically it's the currency, right? Um, well, one more question, and this is my probably my last question. Well, everybody, most of us probably understand that. Well, given the 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 IP address is the the fingerprint of the public key. We can always compute a, a, an encryption key to communicate with with the the, the other end, right? Uh, but after that, I mean, I understand it's an end-to-end -end encrypted network. What other considerations about privacy and security, but specifically about privacy, um, can we? Can we learn from your project? Um, how do you think it can help Bitcoin to, to make the Bitcoin, the peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin network uh, uh, a more resilient network? Well, I mean, I, I think that uh, it's not so much about privacy per se, it's about robustness. Uh, right now, um, right now, we're just praying that they don't turn us off. I mean, as you said, uh, that they're coming for, they're, they're going to come for Wasabi Wallet. And I believe that they're not. You know, I have a, a strong belief that we're going to win. We, at first, they ignored us. And then from, say, 2014 to 2017, they laughed at us. You know, you remember Bitcoin is dead, Bitcoin is dead, Bitcoin is dead. All the newspapers, they just kept saying it. And now we're into the stage that they're fighting us. And we just need to take that fight and be serious about it because they are fighting us and they're telling us they're not fighting us, but we're not going to believe them about that. We can't just have them say, oh, yeah, there's no war on crypto. Just, just uh, don't believe that. You know, it is a propaganda war. They're going to try to 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 fight us on, on the propaganda front. And I want to I want to just hammer home how ridiculous this is. Yesterday on Twitter, um, Everybody who used the word Memphis in the tweet was uh, banned. Just And they said, oh, it was a bug. You know, oops, we, we made a mistake. Well, guess what was happening in Memphis yesterday? Yesterday in Memphis, Tennessee, there was a, um, there, there was a protest against an oil pipeline. And oil pipelines, I cannot, uh, I cannot hammer home enough how uh, irresponsible it is building an oil pipeline right now because we're just at the precipice when – Renewable energy is going to become so cheap that um, oil is just going to be uncompetitive because you don't need anybody greasing oil jacks to uh, to run a um, a solar array. You don't need people shoveling coal to run a solar array. The solar is going to beat the crap out of all of this stuff once it reaches the appropriate scale. And they're still building these oil pipelines, which are just going to pollute everywhere uh, and you know these companies are going to walk away from these oil pipelines and just say, oh, yeah, it's not our problem anymore. You know, you clean it up. And uh, they're, they're still building these things even now in 2021. So, you know, and you have these centralized platforms that are creating these bugs in order to cause people to not be able to talk about and coordinate a protest against an oil pipeline. Uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to say something, but you guys were touching the topic and then moving uh, away from that and then come back all the time. <laughs> I wasn't sure, but uh, yeah, it should be the right time. That I think, you know, if if there is one thing that I I, I learned from from Wasabi, and I think this would be this because, and and this is a very general point on, 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 on privacy projects. Because at the beginning, you know, when I was telling people that this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to build a Bitcoin privacy wallet, and everyone is saying that, that no, you can do that because governments hate privacy and, and only criminals uh, work on privacy and things like that. And, and, and you know, it's, it's not true at all. People in government get how important privacy is. It's just not their first thought and no one is there to remind them that there are consequences. But you know, when, when you reason with people, they they get it. I mean, sometimes you just ask them how much money they have and 
you know, you instantly make the point because that question makes them uncomfortable and, oh, you, 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 you get privacy. So, but, but the point is that these privacy projects are, are always started from these uh, anarchist libertarian uh, roots. And, and, and I think there is a very counterproductive thing here is that, you know, this hacker mindset is that you have to be super paranoid about everything. That's one, uh, and and added to that is that the libertarian and anarchist thoughts that, well, if you are working on privacy, then you are going to be thrown down, and you know, that's not not happening. Uh, people get what you are doing. What's what's happening is when. When, when, when someone creates something and advertises specifically for goods, those are, you know, on, on the line of, well, what should we do with them? And, 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 and those are the things, those get shut down. But, you know, like, it's, it's not that often that privacy companies get shut down. And, and in fact, the, the problem is that no one dares to even start to work on privacy because everyone is saying that it's so dangerous. It's, it's not dangerous. Everyone gets privacy. Privacy is a human right. And, and working on it is, is, is not dangerous. It's natural. Um, sorry for my round, but, but uh, I, I, think, I think we should be more positive and yeah. But, Adam, we were, I don't know, a year ago probably, we were mentioned in an internal uh, intelligent agency that is fighting against who knows what, right? And we are in those reports and in those investigations again and again. So, okay, I mean, Sorry, I think I don't agree with you at all. Um, I mean, I, I want to uh, I, I want to jump in here because I mean I think this is a really important topic. Um, we are clearly in a war, but the war is not with policymakers. Policymakers, we need to work with them, and we need to explain to them the importance of decentralizing power because this power is being centralized in the hands of a couple of these people and companies, these aristocrats, and they are they are holding this power over society, and they're also holding power over policymakers. You've got the European Union; they passed the GDPR. Clearly, they care about privacy. The and I mean. It, Privacy is considered a fundamental human right, um, and it is not difficult to have this conversation with policymakers. It's just that a lot of people are either not doing it because they think the policymakers are the enemy, which is wrong, or they're just thinking that, well, take the case of, uh, okay, CIA does a does a, um, a report on Wasabi Wall. I mean, CIA had a report on, uh, or they had some scraping from uh um, CJDNS in their, in their internal wiki. That doesn't mean that they are against us. That means that they want to know that we're here. And we need to have a public-facing answer to these people. We need to have literature to be able to explain to policymakers, government, whatever, what we're about, who we're, we're fighting for. We're fighting for the individual liberty of people and for democracy. And what we're what is the other side doing? Because the other side doesn't have any problem putting their lobbyists into government, and then they're using their lobbyists to try to make government fight against us. So we need to cut it off where it's actually happening here. Well, yes, I, I, yes, I agree with, with that. But listen, I don't remember if this was ne uh, previous week or a uh, week before that, but... Uh, the uh, I, the European Parliament uh, voted for 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 making yeah. uh, for I mean the the messaging uh, providers and the email provider have to to be able to uh, decrypt basically 
and yeah, messages, I mean, it's, it's, right? it's absolutely tragic what happened uh, last week. And, um, you know, this is this is a loss. This is what happens when we're not in we're not lobbying. You know, we're not talking to policymakers. The other guys go and start talking to policymakers and they are going to use the, their relationships with the policymakers to promote um, to promote policy, which uh, helps them to continue and establish their monopolies over control of the the individual people. So, you know, we win some, we lose some. The policymakers are not our enemy. Um, they are being pulled by our real enemy. Okay, anyway, but they are the one that vote for these things. Yep. For just for for those that don't understand what what uh, this means is, for example, uh, it is not possible to have end-to-end -end encryption anymore because if I provide this, the chat service and I, I need to be able to decrypt your messages, that means that end-to-end -end encryption is not possible anymore. I mean, you, the, mess, the, the, the communication can be encrypted, um, but <laughs> no end-to-end, -end, let's say. I don't know how to explain that. Okay, well, uh, who wants... This, this sorry, sorry, Caleb. So, because someone wants to to speak, and I don't remember. Oh, Locus, please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. So I was just wondering because this sounds a little bit like the Tor project, but the uh, and you have a similar concept on providing bandwidth, and even though Tor Tor itself doesn't really do any accounting on the bandwidth, but you actually have a privacy layer on top of it. So I was wondering if there is a similar risk model related to your project as being a host, a host of the service as running a Tor exit node. What do you think? Uh, it's a bit similar. It's, it's a bit similar uh, as far as your risk profile when you're running a VPN. Um, but unlike Tor, we're not trying to have anonymity of the, um, of the person versus the, the exit. So we're not trying to be uh, strong anonymity. Our point is to have a strong network that is um, robust and resilient to people shutting it down, centralized power. Um, Tor is going in a slightly different direction where they're, tr they're really trying to make it so that nobody knows who anybody is. And that's a very hard problem to solve. And it's a very specific problem. So Tor and CJDNS and Packet will always tend to coexist because they exist on different planes and for different purposes. If it's okay, another uh, question. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, it's a little bit difficult to get a layer, layer two VPN set up. At least I don't know any service providers who would actually do that. Do you support layer two? Um, no, we are layer two. We are a layer two um, because we're not we're not actually doing Ethernet. Um, Ethernet, in my opinion, is not really that useful. It's it's because IP doesn't scale down and Ethernet doesn't scale up. We ended up with these two layers. Um, CJDNS scales both directions, so. Um, on top of CJDNS, we just put an IP packet because it's compatible with um, with ordinary software. I mean, you could do Ethernet over CJDNS, just like why? That's kind of the point. Reasons? Yeah, I mean, you could do it. It's just like it's just like doing Ethernet over a, like a packet over Sonnet or SDH. It's, it's really the similar concept. You just have to write a little bit of code to connect it together. CJDS is a transport. It'll transport anything you want. Okay, good to know. Thanks. Is CJDNS short for coin join DNS? No. Um, it's it's uh, because my initials are CJD and um, there's a long story about that. Uh, originally, it was supposed to be a DNS system, but um, we pivoted it into a uh, being um, a routing system because uh, routing is actually easier to solve than DNS. DNS is a deep political problem that uh, is not my favorite problem to try to solve. OK, 
Okay, I have. Do you know about um, the Lucky Project, the project that it comes from the Monero community? Uh, it, it is not. It is not similar, but it's a networking a solution similar to Tor, and they have a coin to. I mean, a token. I don't know if it is for bandwidth. I mean, it has to be for bandwidth because I, what what else, right? But do right. you know something about that to, in order to make a comparison or to do you have seen to? Yeah, I, I know. I I spoke with the developers of Loki. Um, yeah, it's a it's a Monero fork, as I recall. Um, I mean, here's the thing: they're working on anonymity, and they they want to do an anonymity network. Um, the fundamental thing is that we want to do is we want to do infrastructure. We want to get people access to other people without having to go through networks that can be turned off. That's that's like the key fundamental aspect of Packet. Whereas um, uh, anonymity is just like we can solve anonymity later once we control infrastructure and people that. Uh, the uh, the Bill Gates of the world are not going to turn this off on us. Yeah, it's a good answer. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask uh, the same question. So the, the main differences between uh, CJDNS and Name Tech, I don't know if uh, you uh, know it, um, but it's similar. Is that Nim Mixnet? Yeah, yes. Um, I've just just vaguely heard about it, but I mean, if the point is anonymity, then it's it's really the same answer. It's it's really like we are going to be light on anonymity because anonymity costs you. It, it's it's effort. You have to do software development. You have to waste resources because you're doing onion routing. That's more resources, more latency. Um, that is a worse quality of service for people. Our primary objective is to find a way to get people their their primary internet access that they don't have to that, that it works a hundred percent that they can go stream the videos they want to stream whatever they want to do and then we can layer the anonymity on top of that and that's a primary internet access that's not going to get shut down because it's decentralized by the way we have all um a, a, a meeting um, especially for uh, Mixnet um, so it is already available in YouTube if someone wants to, to know more about uh, Mixnet just a question um, imagine I want to be an internet service provider right how can I buy <laughs> I mean because someone has to provide the, the service to me uh, what is the legal, I mean, I'm sure it's different in, in, from country to country, but uh, how can I I buy that? It, it, it is possible, it is easy. Does the telecommunication companies have a problem with that? Can you tell us a bit? Absolutely. So um, when you're buying internet in a data center, it is actually very easy to do. There are lots of providers. There are lots of companies. Um, it's very competitive. And so th in the data centers, the internet is not there. We don't have a problem of people like potentially turning things off. That's not really where the problem lies. And it's also cheap. It's competitive. It's cheap. There's lots of options. The problem is between the data center and your house because that's where you've got one or two companies. They have not upgraded their networks in 20 years. They, are only, they only move when there's somebody threatening them. And basically the way that they move is to try to crush that threat so that they, they don't have to move anymore. Um, you remember back in the 90s, we had lots of dial up. There was a, a big explosion of different internet service providers and then all of a sudden, the cable and uh, telephone companies, they created DSL and cable, and then they they just squeezed all of those little companies out of existence. And then we've been living, most of us have been living with DSL and cable ever since. So if there's no competition in the, in the market, then these companies will do absolutely nothing. So how would you get a fast internet connection? So... Um, you can you can contract if you let's say you're in a you're in an area where there's no fiber 
you can contract to get fiber run to your house. And there are companies that will do this for you. It's very expensive, but if you're making gonna make money off of the people in your town, then this is potentially worthwhile for you. And the, the way you do it is you, you uh, find one of these companies, you contract with them. The company that owns the telephone poles is usually legally required to allow somebody to put um, their their cables on them as long as they follow certain rules. That's why you have the phone, the cable, and the um, the electricity running on the same telephone poles. The if the electric company owns the poles, they are required to let the phone company use them. If the phone company owns the poles, they're required to let the electric company use them. So based on this legal requirement, you're able to use a company that will run fiber right to your house. You're going to pay for it, but it will get you internet to the nearest data center. And then from there, you're able to um, you're able to le- lease those lines and then you're able to get a um, you're able to get fast internet, which you can then sell to your neighbors. Excellent. Thank you. Guys, someone, do someone has a question for Kayla? Okay, then what yeah. next? Okay. Maybe I just, I just like to repeat what you, what maybe my takeaway from from what CGDNS is, is that I, I imagine this as, as something that goes lower than than the anonymity networks like Tor and the new projects today, or I2P, but it, it is going to a lower layer a little bit, and, and it is only trying to tackle, um, would you say censorship resistance is is this what it provides and and then we would have a censorship resistant internet and on top of that it would be actually well probably anonymity networks would work better on top of that too uh, is that a fair summary or or am i yeah. understanding yeah 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 uh, totally it's a it's about censorship resistance and censorship takes many forms you you don't think about your you're being censored because they haven't upgraded your the quality of your internet in 20 years but that is actually a form of censorship you don't have fast internet that is a way that you are being prevented from communicating all right Thank oh you. wait so so wait Yes, this this can be let's say layer one and also layer two. I mean, it it works also. It can work also as a um, how to say. Um, I, I I forget the word, but basically, um, it can work on top of the existing infrastructure too. Am mm-hmm. I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It works. It works either on you can anything that com- co- connects two computers together, including the existing internet, is working for transporting data for CJDNS. Excellent. Thank you. I wanted to make one final like uh, um, plug here is that um, because the packet system uh, ecosystem has this institution of the network steward. We are always looking for uh, projects and people who are developing technology in the space who need that funding, and that because um, the the packet uh, network steward funds whatever will help benefit the objective of the project. So um, it's something that uh, Wasabi Wallet can potentially participate in, or any of the the side projects of Wasabi Wallet can potentially participate by proposing a project to the the packet network steward and that can be funded it'll be funded in packet but you know you can liquidate that to whatever you want and that's a way that we're able to bootstrap a lot of the technology that we need for this network to work and that that again is one of the reasons why we couldn't have just done this on top of bitcoin because we need that aspect of the financing to build out all of this infrastructure that we need Yeah, 
Yes. Uh, what, sorry. One one more question in order to have an idea of the magnitude of of, of, of the growing of, of this project. Do you have any idea how many, let's say, clients uh, are running this this software? Oh, it's uh, it's a it's a good question. I mean, I can tell you a couple numbers. I mean, there's about 200 people in our um, chat, which is um, packet dot pkt.chat um so you know you can go there and hang out with cool people there's about 200 people in the chat there um there's about 300 people on telegram um i don't know exactly how many wallets there are how many nodes and and so on um these are you know just kind of nebulous numbers um i that's that's basically what i know and then what is that Hyperbolia project or, or website or community? What is that? Well, uh, Hyperborea was a, I mean, I, I say was, it's technically it still exists, but really it was about research on the CJDNS project and, the, and building, the researching the, the technology of CJDNS that was going on between 2012 and 2014, 15 or so. For the most part, Hyperborea is not really active anymore. A lot of the people who wanted to do websites that were kind of in their own little network um, have moved over to the Yggdrasil project. And so research continues with Yggdrasil, which, by the way, are, are great friends of the Packet project. Um, but the, uh, yeah, the Hyperborea, as it were, is not really a thing anymore. And we're moving CJDNS from the research phase to the industrialization phase through the packet project. Okay, thank you. I have one more question. Uh, I, I always have more questions. Um, you know, here sometimes, given we are teaching, we discuss what is the best programming language. It's probably it's useless, a useless discussion, but now, if I understand this correctly, you are, let's say, writing more uh, new versions in Rust. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, why? Um, why? Because I previously used C and I find it just unconscionable at this point to continue developing C or C because there, there are bugs and those bugs are going to harm people and it's just like you 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 memory corruption it's never done and like the person the very people who say oh i'll never have memory corruption bugs i'm too good i'm a good programmer that's only for idiots those are the ones who create the real problems those are the ones who create problems that in the end lots of people get harmed by that so i mean I get it. You know, you've got a legacy project. It's in C, C++. You, you just live with that. That's how it is. You do your best. You, you use C comp. You use whatever you can. Um, no exec stack, that, that kind of stuff. Which, by the way, um, my one patch to Bitcoin was to turn on no exec stack in Bitcoin so that, um, you know, certain really simple 1990s era stack smashing attacks wouldn't work. Um, but... You know, at this point, you know, we want to be doing things securely. The way that you're gonna, you got to do things. We we can't just keep sticking with uh, uh, 20, 30, 40 years old languages. That's my opinion, anyway. Yes, we had some similar discussions. I remember here. Uh, one more question about that: How do you how do you see the productivity of your the people programming? In in Rust, in comparison with with uh, previous experience programming in C or C++, because personally, I, I I'm not a Rust programmer. I tried to to learn it many many years ago, and I was fighting against the compiler. Everything that I did was wrong, basically. So I said, okay, <laughs> I, I will try this a couple of years right. <laughs> uh, after. Okay. Well, Rust has just very recently become onto my radar as something that's there. I mean, uh, you know, five years ago, it just wasn't there yet. You know, it was still in research phase. So now Rust, in my opinion, it's there. So you can just use it. Um, 
And as far as productivity, yeah, I mean, you pay a little bit of productivity in terms of when you're writing the code, it's a little bit less productive than if you're if you're a C++ person, you know, you can just bang out the C++. But where I get major productivity improvements is when I'm reviewing the code. Because if I've got somebody who's making a contribution to CJDNS and they're like, oh, yeah, I've got a big, huge piece of code here. I have to read that line by line to say, well, is that is that a memory corruption issue? Is that a memory corruption issue? Is that a memory corruption issue? And I know I'm not going to be perfect. You know, is something going to slip by? I can't say honestly that nothing's going to slip by. You know, we're only human here. And when somebody makes a contribution in Rust, I can just look at that. I can go through it much more quickly. You know, does it have any unsafe? I can I'm just not having to be as paranoid when I'm doing code review. And I'm sure you understand the same thing. You know, you get, if you, especially if you accept uh, anonymous pull requests into the Wasabi wallet, you got to look at that code and you're like, well, is that somebody trying to do underhanded crap to try to fool me? You know, and, and that's just like, that's the worst thing ever. Yep. Yep. Yeah, well, we, we have now the, the, the problem with the, with memory because we program in a, in a managed language. Uh, we have a garbage, co a garbage collector. But okay. What are you yes, But anyway, reviewing reviewing code carefully because we are, uh, we, we, we have, I mean, people move a lot of money with uh, Bitcoin wallet. And, uh, and, a, and, and a mistake is, could be very, very, very expensive in terms of reputation. And well, it, there's a company behind, so probably it could be more than reputation. So yes, reviewing is is a problem. I cannot imagine if I have to keep track of a collection of pointers. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it, it could be really hard, yeah. Yeah, 